Hi, this is the great Johannes speaking uh, for my podcast episode. This is different from uh, my live streams. During a live stream, I feel compelled to interact with the audience. Now I'm just recording by myself. Um, the podcast, I do it to delve a little bit deeper into a topic, but my podcast may only last maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes at, at, at maximum because I will usually very quickly be done with discussing the topic, right? Um, so this is for The Great Johannes Podcast. You can find it on YouTube at The Great Johannes. Or it's on the podcast system on the Google Podcasts or wherever. Uh, I think it's on Spotify as well. So uh, if you want to subscribe, by the way, go to www.jmk.info. Then you will, uh, for free, of course. Or you, if you want, you can give me a small donation per month, $8 or something. Uh, and that way you stay in the loop. I want to talk about June by Frank Herbert. You may have noticed the new movies are coming out. Uh, but then I've been listening to a very high quality uh, audiobook version of the original Dune uh, book by Frank Herbert. And then I immediately noticed something. And that's because a few days ago I had a discussion with uh, the notable Mr. Daniel Natal on this topic of the British Empire, the Anglo Americans basically. Uh, how they fought the German Empire, how they managed to uh, win this, well, what do you call it? The, there was a struggle between the Germans and the British, basically, over who got to control the global trade. And, well, the Germans lost, the British won. And then when I was reading June by Frank Herbert, I, I noticed it, like, whoa, oh my God. The House of Atreides, imagine that's the British Empire. The Harkonnen, those are the Germans. Uh, Arrakis, the desert planet, that's Arabia. Spice, that's the oil. Now you can connect all the dots. So this actually, whether you believe this or not, it actually relates to something that happened in the real world. Around the 1870s or so, a man named Otto von Bismarck had succeeded in reuniting the Germanies, because Germany used to be like 600 different little dukedoms and princedoms and kingdoms. He managed to unite them under a single banner of a German nation. In doing so then, they began to build uh, their infrastructure because they wanted to be in charge. Uh, this is around the time of the, of the industrialization, the hyper-industrialization of Northwestern Europe, which kind of began in England, but then the Germans responded with their own version of it. And the thing is that the Germans were better at technology than the British were. That's largely also because the British were very good at sailing around the world. They were the best traders, the best merchants, but the Germans, they got real good at technology. To give you an example of why that, why that mattered so much is the British were getting their rubber from, say, Brazil or from Indonesia or wherever, right? The Germans managed to invent a synthetic rubber that they were able to produce, a rubber, fake rubber, rubber that was higher quality for the purpose intended and cheaper to make. And so the Germans were then able, through their high-tech society, to uh, compete with the British on their own turf. So now you, now you see a war between the sea empire and the land empire. And Germany was an emerging Eurasian land empire, and they were able to compete with technology against the trade routes of the British because the British controlled the seas from Europe through the Mediterranean, uh, what is it, the Red Sea, and so on, to, uh, to India and then beyond also to China. Okay, the Germans, however, and I, I'm sure you've never heard of this. I'll, I will show a map on screen. Uh, the Germans started building railroads. Okay, so the Germans didn't have the same access to the seas that the British had. So the British controlled the North Sea and so on, right? I just, I just told you. The Germans thought, wait a minute, what if we build our trade routes over land? And so the Germans actually built a railroad all the way from Berlin to Baghdad, meaning through Serbia, through Eastern Europe, all the way to Baghdad, and also to Cairo and even beyond. So they were able to then trade with the Middle East, for oil, I remember I told you we we're talking about that period of the industrial age where we were at the peak of the industrialization. All this machinery now was no longer running on coal, uh, no more steam engines. They were switching to oil around this time, right? So car, the first cars came along and so on, and then later airplanes as well, right? And so the Germans built their railroads so they were able to do a high volume trade with the Arab world. Namely, they send goods to the Arabs in return for oil. 
okay, but the British, the British also needed the same oil. So there was now a massive competition between the existing British Empire and the emerging German Empire. This was the Second Reich, the Second Reich, basically. The First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire, which ended around 1806 AD. The Second Reich is basically when von Bismarck, Bismarck kickstarted the, Ger the German nation, basically. I, I think modern German nation was founded around 1873. And then Kaiser Wilhelm II takes over and, and everything goes wrong. The Weimar period comes along. But up until 1940, this Berlin to Baghdad railroad it, um, is not only uh, used to transport oil to uh, Germany. Nowadays, we work with pipelines. So in those days, they were working with railroads and, and, and sail routes. But nowadays, it's pipelines. For example, you have oil pipelines and gas pipelines coming from Russia feeding into Europe. There's still like the Turk Stream gas pipeline from Russia that goes in, through Turkey into Eastern Europe feeding, for example, uh, Hungarian homes. But you've heard of the Nord Stream pipeline that was also one from Russia through the Baltic Sea into Germany to feed the German West German industry. Western German industry, by the way, is the engine, the motor of European economy. If you cut that off of cheap fuel, you basically destroy Europe. So the Nord Stream was bombed. Now we know by uh, the British, uh, most likely, but with the support and knowledge of the USA, obviously. So basically, don't see the US and Britain as separate entities. See them as a united ent entity, united under NATO nowadays. NATO. <laughs> So Mr. Daniel Natal explained all this to me. Uh, the U.S. had their revolutionary war to free themselves from the British, right? But the British kept thinking about how do we reel, reel the U.S. back into the British Empire? And the answer is through NATO. With the establishment of NATO, uh, the, the British bankers got back in charge. They, they put themselves back into the seat of the, being the colonial power, basically telling the U.S. what to do. And some say that the Federal Reserve, that prints dollars, is actually owned by people living in London. In any case, I happen to know that when Nixon, Richard Nixon, decided to decouple the, the dollar from the gold standard, it was a man named Rothschild in London who told him to do that. So think about that for a moment. So the US nowadays is an extension of the former British Empire. It's a covert empire, or maybe it's a, it, maybe it's a dead empire, but it lives on in spirit, right? So the British now see the Germans as a massive, massive threat to their existence because the British bankers, the, I call them the London bankers, you can call them the small hats. They were in charge of this whole sphere. They were in charge of, they were ruling the seas. Britannia rules the waves. They were literally in charge of the world, of the world's trade routes, all the important stuff. This is why they have Gibraltar. It's an outpost on the tip of Spain, south, southern Spain, where they control a passage from uh, the North Sea to the Mediterranean, and so they can charge uh, tariffs, right? Or, and the same thing with the Suez Canal. Although first the French colonials were in charge of Egypt, uh, this is around, I'm talking about, say, um, uh, 19th century or so, mid-19th mid century. At first the, uh, uh, the French were in charge there. The French left, but then secretly, covertly, the British took over the colonial rule of Egypt. So in late 19th century, the British are actually in charge of uh, Egypt, primarily because of the Suez Canal that was being dug. So they controlled the Suez Canal, which uh, sees, even today, the Suez Canal transports like 30% of global trade, and most of it is goods flowing from India and China into Europe for the Western European market, right? And for the British market, and nowadays also somewhat to the US, because it's a shortcut. Otherwise, you have to sail all around Africa. By the way, that's why the British were in South Africa, because South Africa used to be that sailing hotspot, the sailing hub, where uh, sailors would have to, could land their ships, refuel, refresh, and then move on to China and India, right? So now they do it through the Suez Canal. Uh, and this is, by the way, this is a whole, a whole story, is that this is, by the way, why the British Empire originally funded and supported the establishment of Israel, which is close to the Suez Canal. Uh, the Israeli army is there. Basically, Israel serves as a sort of a aircraft carrier for U.S. power and Britain power, for the Anglo-American power in the region to make sure that trade is all right, to make sure that <clears throat> they can make money off of uh, tariffs and so, that, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, of course, the Berlin-Baghdad railroad I told you about, guess what? It ran through Palestine, exactly. Uh, eventually, around 1940, the British 
uh, managed to install Serbian nationalists in power in Serbia, or they or they they funded these Serbian nationalist groups. They're, so they're using local nationalist groups to do the biddings of the globalist empire. This was new to me until a few days ago. I really couldn't grasp this concept very well. Is that the globalists often use and fund the Mujahideen or uh, Israeli Zionists, Zionists, and and also Serbian nationalists, and so on and so forth, to, simply to do their bidding on the global chessboard. And so they use the Serbian nationalists in Serbia, that's uh, southeastern Europe, a bit north of uh, Greece, uh, to blow up the Berlin Baghdad Railroad, disconnecting Germany, which is about to start the wars on, on Russia, because around 1939, 1940, Germany starts to wage war on Russia. And what happens, they cut off the Berlin Baghdad Railroad, uh, basically cutting Germany off from oil and so on and so forth, and other supplies that they might have needed from the Middle East and from beyond, from India, because the Baghdad Berlin Railroad uh, also allowed Germans to access the sea so they could then also do. Uh, get access to goods from India and China and so on. So now Imperial Third Reich Germany, we're speaking about the Third Reich now, Third Reich Germany is at this point cut off from uh, resources from the Middle East, yet they're starting a war on Russia, and uh, at this point it could only lose. Von Bismarck, the guy I told you about, Otto von Bismarck, who unified Germany in 1873, who, who was also the mastermind to build that Berlin Baghdad Railroad so that Germany the new Second Reich Germany could have access to oil and uh, other resort riches from Asia. Uh, so Otto von Bismarck, how did he unite the Germans? By telling them that they were one race. You have to imagine it this way. Why was race so important to the Germans? The Germans were the, a, a hodgepodge, uh, a patchwork of all these separate little groups of ethnic people, the Bavarians, the, I don't know, the, I don't know them by name, but um, uh, the, the Batavians, the Karaskar, whatever, right? So, so you have all these different groups, tribal, because, because the Germans were tribal. And then von Bismarck elevates that and says, no, you are one race of people speaking a same language family. And then he expanded this Ger Germanic concept of race to also include the Danes and the Swedes and the Norwegians and the Dutch and the, and the Alsacian um, French people in northeastern France. You have some Germanics there as well. The Belgians, of course, right? They say that Bel uh, Caesar called the Belgians uh, Celts, but they genetically they're actually uh, Germanic and so on and so forth. Right? So maybe culturally Celtic uh, and, and so on and so forth. The Austrians, of course, in, and Hitler basically first grabs the whole Germanic sphere, the Germanic world, including Poland. Mind you, in the past, um, Poland was inhabited by the Goths, who were Go the Gothic Germanics. Who, they were Germanic, basically. They were later, much later, replaced by the Slavic people. As the Slavic people moved through the east, they took a lot of the eastern Germanic territories. Crimea, for example, was also Germanic at some point. Um, the oldest German language Bible is from Crimea. It's written in that Gothic Crimean Germanic uh, language. I can read it. I've read some of this Gothic language, and it's like amazing, like astonishing how how, how this language from the eighth century or so, the Bible, uh, makes so much sense to me. So much more perhaps than Latin and Greek, obviously, or even English translations, right? Um, and so Hitler then pushes for war against Russia. One, from one point of view, that's understandable because now that Germany is getting cut off from uh, the Baghdad Railroad, they can't get access to oil there, they're going to need the Russian resources. So it, in one way, uh, it makes sense that the Germans had to go to war with Russia to try to take Russian resources in, to, to, re to recover what they lost uh, from the Middle East because Britain was taking over the Middle East. Uh, and so that brings me back to the point of June, Frank Herbert's June. Remember, I told you, uh, the British Empire, that's the House of Atreides, they're taking the desert lands for the oil, that's the planet of Arrakis, Arabia, basically. Uh, and then they take it from the Harkonnen, this, tech, this race of technological people, the House of Harkonnen, the Germans and their technology, right? So, because I told you through German technology, the Germans managed to compete with the British Empire by specializing in technological capacity. Uh, and then you have, of course, it's all about the oil. It's the spice, basically. So that's what June, June is really about. And of course, the British, the Atreides, they only care about money. It's not like they're better than the Germans. It's just that the Germans were better at technology. And, uh, and the British Empire felt threatened by this. So that's what this whole story is about. Hitler then goes to try to take, basically, Russia. He wants to uh, Germanize 
uh, the Slavic peoples. He wants to erase the Slavic people, re replace them with Germans. Because under the concept of the Germanic race, that would be a, a solid idea to expand the Germans back eastward, right? Up to the Volga or something, or even further. I think Hitler wanted to go all the way up to the... Um, to the Ural Mountains and annex the whole territory to create a gigantic Christian empire from Gibraltar to uh, to the Ural Mountains or from Ireland, right? And that fails. Hitler loses the war. By 1942, he's defeated at Stalingrad and the Germans begin to retreat. They're beaten back all the way to Berlin. Five million Russian soldiers. No, although 25 million Russian soldiers die, the surviving Russian soldiers rape at least 5 million German women. This is why Eastern Germany nowadays is a bit Slavicized, right? So that's just how it is. This is what happened. But because, because Hitler lost that war, the whole concept of race became racism. Now all of a sudden you were a racist if you, uh, if you supported your, your tribal unity, basically. You can no longer promote uniting the white tribes of the world for example if i would do this now and say wait we have the white we have 110 million christian white russians in russia and northwestern russia mostly like the baltic russians and so on right we have about i don't know 700 million white europeans still or if you want to discount the southern europeans and maybe it's like three or four hundred million white white europeans <laughs> christians mostly and then we have like 200 or 220 230 million white christians uh living in north america what if we would form a northern front together under the banner of race and Christianity, the white Christians of the north? We could do it, but of course the concept of race has been tarnished because of Hitler's loss. Everybody hates Hitler now. Because, and do you see why the British Empire, it is the British and the Americans now who actually have to say they hate racism? Because if they would allow racism again, if the media would stop calling people racist for loving their race, then the Germans could be, could be uniting again. Then the white people of Eurasia, of, meaning the, the white Russians and the white Europeans, could then unite again under the banner of being white and Christian. We can't do that now because the Anglo, it's the Anglo-American media who keep hammering this into us that racism is bad, racism is wrong, because they don't want white people to unite. The whole racism accus accusation exists to, div sorry, to divide the white people so that we cannot unite and cannot defend ourselves against African immigration. Okay, at this point, we have to question something. Uh, why then do the Anglo-Americans push for mass immigration into Europe? Why is that? That is because Arabia is populated by the Muslim peoples, the Arabic and Islamic peoples. They have different factions, the Shia and Sunni and so on. That's irrelevant. But by moving Muslims into Europe, by Islamizing Europe, you combine Europe with Islam and you see what happens next, right? Then the Germans can no longer fight the British. The Germans will basically be powerless in that situation, that scenario. But the British, right, they will provide goods and services and technology products to the Muslim peoples of both the Islamic world and then if they annex Europe and Islam in Islamic Europe as well. And then the Arabs will then be happy to continue pro to providing oil to the British. This is why in 1975, there was the resolutions of Strasbourg that were uh, adopted by the precursor to the European Union, the European Economic Community at the time. They adopted these resolutions spe specifically stipulating that Europe Countries like the Netherlands and Germany had to start promoting Islam in exchange for oil. So the Arabs are now way... So referring back to Dune, in the end, the Fremen, the inhabitants of Arrakis, took control of their own spice. They're in charge of their own oil and they can make demands. And so the Arabs in our world, in the real world, are making the demand that if Europe needs oil, if Britain needs oil, they have to open their borders to mass Islamic immigration. Okay, but this does not co yet quite explain the diversity illusion, delusion. I call it the, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the I call it the, yeah, the, 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 the diversity delusion is why we, bes besides Islamic immigration for oil, why are we importing Africans? Why are we importing Indians? And that is because of the following. There's a new threat looming at the horizon. Remember, the British Empire used to be threatened by German technology. Germany was building the railroad from Berlin to Baghdad to get the oil and, 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 and get access to India and China. But now it's China itself that has risen to power. China has been industrializing throughout the whole 20th century and even 
accelerating in the early 21st century, our century. And so China now is building a new Silk Road with railroads from Beijing to Berlin. That's why there's a war in, Iraq, uh, in Ukraine, because the Ukraine war, uh, the railroad from Berlin to Beijing has to go through Ukraine. And so there's a war there to try to sabotage, just like the Serbian nationalists in 1940 sabotaged the Berlin-Baghdad Railroad. Now there's Ukrainian nationalists, the Azov uh, idiots, who are destroying the, the possibility of a direct link by train between Berlin and Beijing. Again, sabotaging the German industry, because if Germany could link up with the Russian resources now and with the Russian, uh, Chinese market, bing, 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 all of a sudden the German race would be back on the map. All of a sudden they would be in charge not only of their own economy, but of all of Europe's economy, and possibly they would be the engine of the entire Eurasian continent, right? With the help of the access to the Chinese market and Chinese labor, and then the Russian resources and the German industry, because Germany is still close to Western Europe, where you have a massive market for, for expensive products, for luxury items and so on, right? And so it's all messed up now is that the Anglo and the American leadership, I'm never talking about the people, the American people are innocent, right? The British people, the English people are innocent, right? But their leaders are not. Their leaders are completely nuts. They need the whole world to side with them. And that's the diversity delusions origin. They need the India on the side of the West. That's why you see so many CEOs from Indian origins in the USA. That's political. That's a political decision made by the U.S. State Department. We need more Indian CEOs so that Indian people will look up to our companies and basically culturally and mentally join the West rather than China because Indian men will be required to wage war on China eventually. It's not even necessary for war, but it's, it's meant to make sure that Indians will start buying Western goods and services rather than Chinese goods and services directly from China. Although it's fine if China sells its goods to the US and then the US sells those goods back to India. That's fine, but not directly. They do not want Indian people to start buying from China directly. They want to separate India from China. That's why they have this, na this nonsensical diversity of this mass immigration going on into the West. The mass immigration into the West is really a, a, a globalist trick. Multiculturalism, diversity are a globalist trick to, get to, to try to get the world on their side against China. Because China, like Germany in the, in, uh, during the Second World War, is now becoming a threat to the Anglo-American power, globally speaking. Wow, okay. This, of course, does not serve people like us, people like me, all right? Uh, it, it, it means the end of us. It means they're literally trying to discard the white middle class, white people. They don't need us anymore because we don't control the power base at this point. We don't have energy or oil or, and the industry no longer matters. It's, the inner, Europe is being deindustrialized to move everything to the US and to the Arab world, right? So Europe is being stripped. However, Europe did used to always have one more thing that was our power base and that was be the pastures of Northwestern Europe where you can do uh, pastoralism and grow your cattle producing milk and meat. Indeed, the Netherlands is, I believe, the number one or the number two meat producer in the world, despite being a small country. Uh, with the pastures, we have access to high quality protein production, which we could always sell to the rest of the world. We are a very highly productive uh, agricultural zone, Northwestern Europe, because of the low lying land and the right temperature, flat land, you know, the Alps, Okay, but then north of the Alps in Europe, it's flat land. The Netherlands, northern Germany is all nice. Uh, Denmark, southern Sweden, it's all nice flat land. And of course, uh, that's why they're attacking the farmers in Europe now. If you would remove the farmers now, then the white Europeans of, the, of North European stock, the Anglo-Saxon types, like the Germanic types, the Nordic types, will have no more power base. We won't have energy and we won't have land for pastoralism. We will be left with nothing. So they're trying to kill us off, I think, in the war, a fake war against Russia. I think Putin's also a globalist. So they're going to try to get white men of the West under these nationalist banners to try to fight those naturalist Russians and try to kill each other off so they get rid of us. They're trying to purge us. But we're not going to allow that. You see, there are several ways out of this. 
I told you about China's new Silk Road. They want to connect with Europe, but Europe isn't allowed to because the American overlords tell them they can't do that. That's why there's a war in Ukraine to make sure that the West does not link, uh, Western Europe does not link up with China when we should, right? Because it would be in our benefit. There are several things that might happen now, several things that we can do for ourselves. Everything seems lost, but it's not. It's not lost at all. Why else do you think they have to so heavily crack down on white people? Why do you think they have to humiliate us with these absolutely horrid, monstrous uh, statues of certain people in our cities? In London, Trafalgar, Star sorry, Trafalgar Square, they're going to install a sort of, you know, mama figure. <laughs> Things they're doing in New York City, Fifth Avenue, they, they put uh, statues of people that are right bulky faces troll faces the orcs from lord of the rings you know what i'm talking about they're putting that in your they're shoving all that in your face they're cracking down on you they're not hiring you anymore they're firing white people you're not getting what you deserve you are being discriminated against by your own governments in your own countries while they rob you blind and destroy your industry and then tell you to die right it seems like all is lost but they wouldn't be they wouldn't be fighting us so hard if there weren't a way out and all i'm here now to do for you is at the, at the at the conclusion of this video almost 30 minutes in um i'm going to tell you what we can do there are several strategies here and we we can pick one we could help facilitate the destruction of the urban world by cutting off supplies fuel electricity and water into the big cities into the industrial zones by deliberately collapsing our economies further than the globalists want to do we would be able to starve the big cities that will be the end of diversity coming into western europe right uh, and it will also mean it would mean that about 80% of the population in Western Europe would die out because of such an act. So this would be meaning we could be terrorists, but it would be in our benefit. The 20% of survivors would live on with their pastures, with milk and high protein meat. And then we can start working on program two. The second option is we can somehow um, refuse to fight the wars for globalism. You see, they still have to purge us in that war against Russia. What if we refused to fight for the Anglo-American interests? What if we European men in Europe refused to fight that fight? And that we demand that we, that we do link up with China, with the Chinese Silk Road, so we can uh, kickstart our industries again. But here I have a, a dual opinion. Why would we want to kickstart our industries again if that only means more mass immigration again? Why not deliberately continue the deindustrialization of Europe and drive out 80% of the inhabitants from Western Europe and then somehow become more of a Spartan warrior society that will become so hostile and so unpleasantly intolerant of foreigners that no one will want to live here anymore except us. That's one way to do it. Uh, like I said, there's a more civilized option that would be we will enforce trade with China. We will allow China to link their new Silk Road up with Europe. There will be a Berlin-Beijing railroad. I hope it can be a direct ticket so you can have a very, like, like, the, like the train from Moscow to Vladivostok, we would have one from Berlin to Beijing. That would be, would, would be mightily nice and fine. We would also, by the way, Zeppelins. Why do you think the Americans refused to sell helium to the Germans? And they, the Germans were then forced to use hydrogen for their Zeppelins, for their airships, because it's explosive. So the Hindenburg disaster, was it sabotage? I think so. I think the Americans sabotaged the Hindenburg and make it, made it blow up. So then they put in our cultural memory the association between uh, the Zeppelin disaster and uh, airships, right? So whenever you think of airships, now you're thinking of these things blow up, they're a disaster. Why? Because airships can float over land. Airships are land ships, right? You have the ships of the British Navy that sail around uh, India, and you have airships over land that could fly from Berlin to Beijing. Ah, so that's why the British Empire also did not want you to have Zeppelins. Even though nowadays we are working on an improved version of this technology, as long as, but I wonder if it will be allowed because we are going to have to use Zeppelins for unlocking the Eurasian landmass. There is so much land in Eurasia, say Siberia and so on, where no one can live because the supply routes are so difficult, so difficult to get there, but not with airships. If we would bring back Zeppelins with helium, of course, not hydrogen, 
and they would be safe and we would unlock the whole Eurasian continent. We could do so much more here. We would, in fact, become more powerful than the British. And the second thing is railroads. R remember when they show you photos of Auschwitz, they always show you the railroad leading into Auschwitz. The British Anglo-American media seriously wanted to associate airships with disaster and railroads with concentration camps. Do you see what they've done? Do you see what they've done? Railroads and airships are actually the solution to make Germany the most powerful nation on earth. But they didn't want you to know that. And I hope you kind of understand that now, because that's our future. We're going to work with railroads and zeppelins to unlock the Eurasian world island, right? Making us Germanic peoples a, a linchpin in the whole new world, not the Anglo. We are finally going to defeat the Anglo-Americans. Thank you very much.